one of the most iconic JRPGs of all time. Chrono Trigger soared above the rest, delivering a heart-racing plot, a cast of deep, memorable characters, a unique battle system, and a wicked soundtrack that sent the composer, Yasunori Mitsuda, out of commission for working non-stop to prove a point to his boss. It went on to spawn an accidental sequel, Radical Dreamers, and then a kind of remake of Dreamers and proper sequel to Trigger, Chrono Cross. Welcome to another episode of Game Analysis. I have a guest speaker with me who helped with the research and script for this video. Please welcome Sabotender. Hey, Myra. Wow, we're finally doing this. We have talked about this for ages, and now it's happening. I'm so excited to dig into my all-time favorite game with you. And now that I've said it's my favorite game, I can't wait to get something wrong in this video and have someone in the comments rip me apart for not having my facts right. So yeah, um, as for me, I don't have a huge online presence, but I am fairly involved with the Link to the Past randomizer community. I'm an admin for the tournaments there. You might see me on Twitch from time to time. Um, but other than that, I'm pretty much a ghost online. We will be focusing on Chrono Trigger, Radical Dreamers, and of course the sequel that everyone was hyped for, Chrono Cross. While we won't address every single detail, as there are a lot, we have tried to incorporate as many theories and views on the series as we could. As you would expect from a video like this, there will be lots of spoilers. <laughs> Let's have a look at the episode structure. We've got the story of Chrono Trigger, the story of Radical Dreamers, the story of Chrono Cross. We go on to themes with time travel, the balance of nature, and parallel worlds. Connections, we have the world with characters such as Shala and Kid, Magus, Gil or Guile, Luca, and other general characters. We also have items such as the Masamune, the Chrono Trigger slash Time Egg, the Chrono Cross slash Dragon Tear, the Frozen Flame, Marl's Pendant, and the Mammon Machine. We move on to theories and development with the Entity, Dalton and the Pore Army, Dreamstone and the Frozen Flame, the Surge's Janus argument, Beach Bum, that's new, which is the true sequel, and allusions to John Milton's Paradise Lost. We end it with some fun facts and then the real Chrono Talks, where Sabu and I will talk about various topics about Chrono Trigger in an open kind of discussion way. They will be divided into serious topics and not so serious topics. Now that you know what to expect, let's start. Our story begins with the ringing of a bell. The theme of time is immediately introduced as over at the Millennial Fair. Lean's bell greets the citizens of Guardia to another day, and Chrono, our silent protagonist, slowly gets out of bed after some pestering from his mother. Chrono's friend Luca will be unveiling a new invention at the fair, and Chrono goes in support. There, he runs into, quite literally, whether you try to avoid it or not, a girl who doesn't seem exactly forthcoming about who she is. She insists you call her Marl. Chrono and Marl spend some time cruising around the fairgrounds. There are a number of quirky little events at the fair involving Marl that seem innocent enough. Except eating the old man's lunch. Why would you do this, Chrono? But they'll have an impact later on. So, after the little date with Marl, Luca's demonstration begins. She's created a teleporter and needs a volunteer. While it is a little baffling that this girl and her father have created a device that transports matter in a society that doesn't seem that far past the Middle Ages, uh, whatever. Don't ask questions. Get on the pad, Chrono. Miraculously, the device works. Seeing this, Marl wants to give it a go. However, something goes wrong, and it appears to have something to do with Marl's pendant. A portal opens up, and Marl is pulled into it. She vanishes without a trace, and I absolutely love that the crowd that had gathered just casually walks away. No one thinks to ask, Hey, whatever happened to that pretty girl, Taban? Whatever power the pendant has, Chrono doesn't waste any time in volunteering to follow Marl. What a good protagonist. The machine fires up and the same thing happens to the pendant. The portal opens up and Chrono also falls victim. Here we go, folks. Chrono ends up in a seemingly new world where monsters attack him. I mean, that's strange, but what's even weirder is the map. It looks suspiciously similar to the one back home, but enough of that. 
Chrono goes ahead and finds Guardia Castle. And Marl in a fancy dress? She explains to Chrono that when she appeared, they assumed she was the missing Queen Lean. A sweet moment happens between the two new friends, and then Marl disappears. Chrono runs into his friend Luca, who also took the time travel portal to catch up to him. She tells Chrono that they are currently in the past, 600 AD to be precise, and explains that Queen Lean is missing. But when they discover Marl, they call off the search and broke the timeline, creating a grandfather paradox. Without Lean being rescued, Rescued, Marl doesn't exist because, wait for it, she's Princess Nadia from their time and a direct descendant of Lean. Chrono and Luca search for the real queen and come across a strange church. It turns out the church was a secret base for the monster Yakra, who kidnapped the queen. Upon killing Yakra's followers, Luca is saved by a walking, talking frog, who is called, appropriately enough, Frog. He seeks to save the queen and accompanies you. When you reach the depths of the monster base, you meet their leader, Yakra, who disguised himself as the Chancellor of Guardia Castle to get close to the queen and kidnap her. You defeat him, save the queen, and restore the timeline, bringing Marl back into existence. You then head back home to the present day in 1000 AD. Marl has been away from the castle for a while now, so probably best to take her home. Only when you do... Chrono is accused by the Chancellor of abducting the princess and must be tried for kidnapping. Thus begins one of the most iconic scenes in the game, the trial. Remember all those little events from the Millennial Fair uh, that had no real impact early on? Uh, now they are coming back to haunt you. That's right, you who stole the old man's lunch. You're gonna get what's coming to you. Well, anyways. Depending on whether you behaved or not during your date, the jurors will determine you to be guilty or not. Funny how so much of the evidence is circumstantial and based around character witnesses, <laughs> Judge Judy would have a field day. So you wind up in jail regardless. Even if you were a saint, they throw you in the slammer. Of course, Chrono's no dummy and breaking out is the thing to do. Luca comes to your aid, and you face off against Dragon Tank on what I think is the only 2D battle plane. Makes some of the animations look a little goofy, but never mind, this game is still great. Having left the Chancellor in a precarious situation, we're almost home free, except for an increasing number of guards attempting to stop your escape. That's when Marl pulls the Nadia card and stops the guards in their tracks. She intervenes and joins Chrono and Luca in their escape. Still being pursued, the crew finds another portal. Luca throws up the gate key, and our heroes take a chance, hoping to come out somewhere safe. The portal opens up, and, uh, well, at least we got away from those soldiers. But where exactly did we end up? This world appears to be futuristic, but is a world of ruin. A vicious sandstorm sweeps across the globe, and buildings lie in rubble. Only a few domes remain. Horribly mutated creatures claw at us, and bugged out robots attack. We've been flung into the future, but something has clearly happened between the year 1000 and the year 2300. We stumble through this wasteland to the Eris Dome, meeting some of the few surviving humans, and try to help them reach their food supplies in the basement of the dome. It goes from bad to worse for these folks as the refrigeration units have failed, spoiling all the remaining food. Our heroes do find a seed, and that might just be the little ray of hope for these people. Also here in Aristone is an information center with a giant computer. Luca manages to get it going again, and we learn that this creature, Lavos, destroyed the planet raining down calamity on the world in the year 1999. Realizing that they are currently in the dystopic future created by Lavos, our heroes vow to change the past to save this timeline. To do so, the information we gain seems to indicate that heading for Protodome is the way to go. To get there, we have to race Johnny, a bizarre car humanoid thing who's got all kinds of real cool attitude. He's a very 90s Japan kind of character. Upon arriving at the Protodome, which we were told had a time gate thanks to the Lavos Doomsday computer, we find the door locked and a lone, disused robot. Luca takes the initiative and starts repairing the robot, telling an uneasy Marl that machines aren't capable of evil, 
Humans make them that way. After repairing the robot, now named Robo, the team of your choice tackle the factory up north to unlock the door at the dome. As Chrono and crew make their way through the factory and start up the main generator, unlocking the door in Protodome, you encounter a mini army of blue robots similar in style to Robo. They start beating them up, calling them defective, not listening to your party's pleas to stop. Robo denies being defective, but the jerk robots don't listen. After you trounce those assholes, you take poor busted Robo back to be repaired at the dome. He is grateful towards Luca and the others and is determined to follow them on their quest to save the world. They open the now accessible portal and go through it. Yay, friendship! Yay, friendship! But uh, this time, something goes wrong with the portal. It glitches and spits our four heroes out at the end of time, where a mysterious old man watches over the very fabric of space and time. He tells our heroes that the end of time is where travelers lost in time's flow end up. Here we learn that we can travel between time periods, but must limit our group to three. The old man has a friend here at the end of time, a Specchio, a magical being who unlocks our hero's elemental potential allowing them to use magic, the ancient skill once used long ago. With new texts learned, we jump into a portal we haven't used yet, one that takes us to Medina Village in 1000 AD. Medina is the home of the Mystics, a group made up of somewhat more magically inclined monsters, who have the ability to speak with humans. They're quite hostile, and want Chrono and the gang to leave as soon as possible. The shop in town charges outrageous prices for gear, and I know when I was growing up, I thought one day I'd save up the cash to buy from the store, assuming it was amazing equipment. Turns out it isn't. The people in Medina worship a guy named Magus, who led the mystics in a war against the humans 400 years ago. Seems he may have summoned or created Lavos, the monster we just learned about in 2300 AD. Outside of town, we find Melchior's hut. We met him at the fair, but here he's got some new wares for sale. Past his place is the Hecron Cave, an area that gets us to test out that new magic we learned from Specchio. At the end of the cave is a whirlpool that whisks us over to Luca's house, back where we started this whole adventure. Having learned about Magus and his connection to Lavos, Luca suggests we go back to 600 AD to learn more about him. And because we're back in our hometown, we can use the portal in the fairgrounds. So, that war between the mystics and humans? Yeah, it's popping off here in 600 AD. The mystics try to make their way north into Guardia by crossing the Xenon Bridge. But Chrono and team push back the enemy, as well as Magus' second-in-command, Ozzy, allowing our heroes to investigate the southern continent. The towns of Sandorino and Por are here, and both towns are abuzz with word the hero has emerged to fight Magus' army. We find Frog in his hideout, and he's being all emo about being worthless, not being able to help anyone. And here we get our first mention of the Masamune, the Sword of Legend. We explore the Denodoro Mountains and find Tata, the supposed hero, who in reality is just a child who found some metal and then everyone was acting like he was the second coming of Jesus or something. At the top of Denodoro are Masa and Mune, the spirits of the Masamune Sword. They offer us the broken blade of the legendary sword. Going back to Frog with the hero medal and half of the Masamune, Frog is still sulking because he needs the sword to defeat Magus, and in its current state, it can't do a thing. We find that Frog has been holding on to the hilt of the legendary sword this whole time, and inscribed on it is a familiar name, Melchior, the guy outside of Medina. We should probably talk to him about this. When you arrive at Melchior's house near Medina, he says Chrono needs to acquire some Dreamstone in order to reforge the legendary blade. He hints that it has been long extinct. So guess what? We gotta go as far back in the past as we can. Thankfully, there's a time portal at the end of time that Chrono and crew have yet to use. 
When Chrono and crew arrive in 65 million BC, they encounter some strange reptile monsters, who then get savagely kicked by a blonde-haired woman. After dispersing the enemy, the cave woman named Isla takes a liking to Chrono and invites him to a feast. You celebrate with your new friend as Isla's man Kino looks on with jealousy. You have a soup race! contest with Isla and win the dreamstone you required to repair the sword. How easy was that? Well, you wake up in the morning to find a whole bunch of reptite tracks everywhere and the portal key is missing. Shit. When you go to wake up a not at all hungover Isla because you were drinking soup. She claims it was the Reptites who did it, and that she will help get your key back. When you go to pursue the enemy, you find Kino, who admits to stealing the portal key, but then lost it to the Reptites. You eventually get to the Reptite lair and confront the leader of the Reptites, Azala, the queen of the Reptites. After defeating her brute, Nisbel, you get the gate key. Isla pukes from HAVING TOO MUCH SOUP and are able to head back to reforge the sword. We return to Melchior's hut. The old man, astonished that we actually found some dreamstone. In no time, the Masamune is ready to go, so let's hurry back to Frog. This entire time, dude's been hanging out in his hole, listening to Lincoln Park, I assume, and moping about. We return with the Masamune, and he finally snaps out of it. So, let's uh, recap here. While you were hanging out in your hole here being all sad, uh, we climbed a mountain, fought a tough-ass boss, went back 65 million years into the past, beat up some reptites, and found a stone that doesn't exist in present day to fix your sword for you. Um, can you finally give up the I'm a loser act? Thanks. Frog gives us some backstory on why he's been so miserable all this time, telling us about Cyrus, the knight he worked for as a squire, and their unfortunate encounter with Magus that left Cyrus dead, and Frog, who we learn was named Glenn, well, as a frog. But with renewed confidence, Frog takes us over to the magic cave, where, using the Masamune, he splits a mountain in half to open access to the cave. Through the cave, we reach Magus's castle. This is such a great dungeon. It's spoopy and mysterious, with some good bosses and a climactic final battle. Along the way, we dispose of Magus's henchmen, Ozzy, Flea, and Slash, named after rock stars, but not really sharing anything else in common with their real-world namesakes. The final scene in this dungeon is amazing. Torches light the way to Magus. He mocks Frog and faces the party, ready to do battle. The music is queued up perfectly for this scene, and it just makes the whole scene pop. After the battle, Magus reveals that he didn't give birth to Lavos, but merely summoned him. Lavos has been dormant inside the planet, slowly absorbing the Earth's power. A giant portal opens up and swallows everyone, Magus included. somehow end up in 65 million BC and reunites with Isla, the lovable prehistoric babe. You learn of a village that had been attacked by the Reptites, and you go with Isla to fight Azala, and end the feud between them once and for all. You take Dactyls, which for some reason aren't aligned to the Reptites, and fly to the impressive Tyranno Lair that sits in the middle of a volcano, very safe. You confront Azala, who is sat admiring the red star seen in the sky. 
Hmm, strange. A fight ensues where the protagonists are set to face off against Azula and the fearsome Black Tyranno, introducing you to the seriously cool boss song. After defeating the pair, Azula says the Red Star will scorch the Earth and usher in an Ice Age. Then, surprisingly, Isla drops Lavos's name, saying that La means fire and Vos means big! How the naming of the extraterrestrial being Lavos survived millions of years is baffling, but it did. So yes, Lavos fell from the sky and is the red star Azala was talking about. Lavos creates a giant crater where the Tyranolaire once stood and buried itself underground instantly. What remained at the bottom of the crater was a portal. Kroner and crew take it and end up in an entirely new era. Whoa, where are we? This is one of those moments when I first played the game, I was gobsmacked that there was another time period to explore. That Ice Age Azala spoke of came to be, it seems, as this time period is a frigid one, with snow and ice everywhere. All that we have access to is this very unusual portal. Stepping onto the glowing pad, it whisks us skyward. The relentless blizzard has stopped, and there is greenery. What is this place? It's the floating kingdom of Zeal. So while the world wastes away down below, things are peachy keen for the folks up here. The people of Zeal have the ability to use magic and live in a dreamlike state. The first place we visit is Anhasa, and in here we run into a little boy who drops a line we've heard before, the Black Wind Howls. Now, who was it that said that? Just can't quite put my finger on it. Was someone important? Hmm. Anyways, there are a lot of people to talk to and lots to learn about this place. We again run into the boy from earlier, Giannis, which I must say is a very clever name choice by the English translation team. Giannis, of course, being the Roman god of beginnings, gates, transitions, time, duality, doorways, passages, and endings. And uh, he has an older sister, Scala. She is blessed with uh, extraordinary magic powers, so she's likely going to factor in a little later. We learn about something called the Sunstone, the Ocean Palace, the Mammon Machine, and Queen Zeal, who seems a bit off her rocker. The three gurus, Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar, were banished from Zeal by the Queen despite their contributions to the kingdom. Bad optics, Queen Zeal. Not good. We also learn that the Queen has taken a more tyrannical turn of late since the Prophet came to town, whoever this guy is. Spoiler alert, it's Magus. He knows a lot about what will happen, and so finds himself as the right hand of the Queen. The Mammon Machine is a particularly nasty device, as it directly harnesses Lavos' power to be used by the people of Zeal. Seems like a bad idea. The Queen's plan is to move it to the Ocean Palace, so it can draw even more energy from Lavos. We again run into Scala, just as she is summoned to the throne room here at Zeal Palace. We follow her and see that she uses a pendant that looks just like Marl's to open the door. Holding up Marl's pendant to the door just gives us a big old boop boop. After receiving a hot tip, we head over to the Mammon Machine and charge our pendant up. Back to the throne room. Here we find the Queen, Scala, the hotshot knight and Dalton, and our not-so-mysterious prophet. The Queen is furious that foreigners would oppose her, and she imprisons our heroes. Scala attempts to rescue Chrono and the gang, but the prophet stops her. He marches us down to the portal we came from, forces us in, and has Scala seal it. We may be unable to return for now, but what about that pendant we charged up? What might it do? With the powered-up pendant, Chrono and crew eventually gain access to where Balthazar ended up. Behind the sealed door was a time machine aptly named the Wings of Time that he created in order to return to his time, but unfortunately passed away before its completion. Before his death, he imprinted his personality on a robotic assistant, the New, who eventually completed the time machine. Now we have a way to return to Zeal. The Epoch brings them back to the Blizzard Land, but they are still unable to access Zeal due to Shala's seal. Damn it! 
Before Shala sealed the gate, she requested Chrono and crew help free Melchior, who was imprisoned on the top of the Mountain of Woe after defying the Queen. The Earthbound folk in this time welcome you into their village, which conveniently grants you access to the mountain. The mountain itself is weird because it's floating, yet it's chained to the ground. Why? Who knows? When you defeat the boss at the top of the mountain and free Melchior, it falls into the sea and Shala meets up with Chrono and Melchior in al -Gedi, the land people village. You gain the ruby knife and are instructed to destroy the mammon machine in the ocean palace. But first they must confront the queen and persuade her to stop her madness. Heading back up to Zeal, the gang makes their way to the palace throne room only to find Dalton there. Everyone else has already gone down to the ocean palace. So you fight Dalton, and then warp down to the palace as well. The Ocean Palace is a grueling dungeon, but after slogging through it, our heroes reach the Mammon Machine and the Queen. Chrono lets the Ruby Knife do its thing, but it might be too little too late as Lavos appears. This is the big baddie we've been searching for this whole time, but hot damn is he strong. He wipes out the entire party, and when the Prophet steps in, he too is knocked back. Here is where the game takes a pretty neat twist. Chrono sacrifices himself to protect his friends, and Lavos turns our hero to dust. Scala uses the last of her power to send everyone to the surface, and it seems like it's curtains for her. With the Madden Machine having summoned Lavos, the dude bursts through the surface of the planet like we saw in that 1999 video, and his destructive rays pierce Zeal, sending it crashing into the sea. The survivors both enlightened and earthbound, congregate on the one piece of land left, still in shock from what has happened. Unfortunately, while Lavos and the destruction of the Ocean Palace took out a lot of the real turds of Zeal, somehow, much like a cockroach, Dalton has survived. He has declared himself ruler of the remains of the kingdom, and immediately imprisons our heroes in the Blackbird, which now plies the sky above. In an interesting bit of story to mix up the gameplay, our hero's equipment has been taken, and we must sneak around the Blackbird to get it back. Unless you take Ayla, and she'll start kicking ass and taking names right off the bat. It's the way to go for sure. Once you collect all your stuff, you learn that Dalton has stolen Epa, but he plans to put wings on it, so that's good. As long as we get it back, He's such a dummy that you end up fighting him on the wind depot, and he loses in spectacularly lame fashion. Now we've got our time machine back with the added bonus of wings. At this point, an interesting choice can be made. There is a way to bring back Chrono, but if you choose, you can leave him dead as the end game is now open. It would be an odd choice to not revive the main character, but the option is there. Following the standard narrative, though, Gaspar at the end of time tells us that there is a way for Chrono to be revived. It requires the Time Egg, aka the Sea Trigger, and an exact clone of the person who is to be revived. Now, where the heck are we supposed to get that? Well, apparently, Norstein Beckler. Why does he get such an elaborate name? He's a complete throwaway character. Uh, the guy that runs the carnival tent at the Millennial Fair happens to have a clone of Chrono ready to go. How Gaspar knows about this dude and why Beckler has a Chrono Clono handy are great questions with no answer. Not Chrono, but Crew, climb up Death Peak due to its apparent power to restore life, battling the harsh wintry weather and fighting off Lavos spawn. When they reach the top, they must wait for the eclipse before they can use the Chrono Trigger, an egg-shaped item. Gaspar tells them that the egg has the potential to revive Chrono, and that they must hatch it. But like an egg, it may or may not hatch. Thankfully, their plan works, and they return to the moment in time where Chrono was destroyed, replacing the real Chrono with the clone doll they got from Beckler. By replacing a dummy in that moment, the rest of the characters still believe Chrono was killed that day, and that belief led them to reviving the real one. Without the trick, they would not have pursued their method of reviving Chrono. Now with Chrono back intact, they continue with their plans to destroy Lavos once and for all. So, the way to Lavos can be as simple as hopping into Epoch, or looking in the mysterious bucket at the end of time. But that big ol' ominous floating nightmare castle is the true way to go. 
The Black Omen is essentially the ocean palace raised high into the sky. Using the power of Lavos, the Mammoth Machine, and her innate magic power, Queen Zeal raises the ocean palace and holds up, waiting for the day of Lavos's birth. It shares a lot of the same odd futuristic touches as the Ocean Palace, but is much larger, with a slightly more warped, evil motif. It's a difficult journey to the top of the Black Omen, but reaching the top to confront Zeal, our heroes can see the entire planet from the top. Which makes me think, how damn big is this thing? It goes up into space? What's the oxygen like up that high? Probably not good. After taking down Zeal once and for all, our party is transported to where Lavos is. The first part of the fight is the standard issue Lavos we have seen before, but when the shell finally cracks, that's when things ramp up. Our heroes feel an evil energy emanating from Lavos and head inside to find out what's going on. They find an alien creature with tentacles that is the source of the drain on the planet. Dispatching this foe, you think it might be over, but nope, we've got to go even deeper, right into Lavos's core. The core is an even goofier looking alien, and the fight itself is odd, as the enemy at the center isn't even the piece you're trying to defeat. It goes against everything we've learned about bosses prior, and it goes against all of RPG battle tradition. Why would the little floaty bit thing on the right actually be the big bad? That doesn't make a lick of sense. This part of the fight is pretty trippy, as Lavos's core seems to have absorbed all of time and the battlefield shifts through different eras. This final boss is a long one, when factoring in all three parts, and even longer if you've just come from the trio of Black Omen bosses. Chrono Trigger features multiple endings, depending on when you fight Lavos, but the standard playthrough sees our characters return to their respective time periods through the portal at the fairgrounds. The one piece of dialogue to note is if Magus is in your party, as Marl asks him, are you going to look for Scala? To which Magus says nothing, but we assume the answer is most definitely yes. This is a key connector to Radical Dreamers. The game ends with our heroes heading off on another adventure in the epoch, visiting the other time periods, offering some mini epilogues for the other characters. Radical Dreamers and the Unstealable Jewel is a text-based visual novel type game made on the Satellaview add-on for the Super Famicom in Japan. It features three characters, the main character and narrator Serge, the young thief Kid, and the mysterious magic man named Gil, or Magil in the English ROM translation. The three of them are looking for the Frozen Flame, a wish-granting device that is being kept in the Viper Manor. The manor belongs to a terrifying aristocrat named Lynx, who murdered the Acadia Dragoons, the former political and military power Power that ruled the land before the game starts. Before reaching the manor, our narrator Serge points out that Kid seems to have a bad history with the man named Lynx. Although she doesn't mention much, it can be teased out with certain actions when you look around the manor. The group navigate their way around Viper Manor, piecing together the story that it held from each new room they encounter. They learn of Lynx's adoptive daughter, Riddell, how Lynx possessed a mirror of whispers, where a spirit is contained within the mirror and can show them many things if desired. Upon asking about Kid, the mirror shows the tragic scene of a girl crying as an orphanage is burning before her. Not much else is explained as Kid tells it to stop. Continuing on, you look in the study, then to a dusty old door that leads to the clock tower storeroom. Kid is eager to take something, selecting a giant sword that she wishes to flog, only to have McGill tell her to put it down and focus. An old lady emerges from seemingly nowhere, and then she addresses Kid, saying, If you want to steal the jewel, and if you really want to beat him, you must give up your most valued possession, Kid. As long as you cling to it, the hands of your clock will never budge. They'll stay frozen, trapped in the distant past. 
eager to move on, the crew come across the treasure vault ahead in the corridor. It's locked. So they go upstairs to a cold, uninviting room. Inside they see old blood caked on the floor along with this message. They spring a trap and only just manage to get out in the nick of time. Fed up and wanting that treasure, Kid and crew go to Lynx's quarters to ask the mirror where the key is. Back in the study, they find the key, unlock the treasure vault, and of course, set off the alarm once inside, causing the doors to close behind them. They achieve nothing as the frozen flame in the room is a fake. After escaping the brutal fight against the guard goblins and acquiring a strange shaped item, they go to the last corner of the manor. The atrium, located just down from Riddell and Lynx's quarters, is a room that fills with water and some hungry piranhas make it impossible to go through. Thankfully, upon their escape back to the hallway, they find a strange statue. After it bites Kid and she shatters its teeth, Surge takes it upon himself to insert the weird-shaped item into it, causing the water in the other room to drain. Through the atrium, they find another locked door labeled the Catacombs. But the key is not far. In the armory down the hall, a strange goblin shares their tea and asks for a story in exchange for the key. Once the goblin is amused, he grants them the key. On a side note, the kitchen is located nearby. Inside, they meet a rat who tricks them into releasing him, turning into a griffin, who, well slips and falls and fails to attack them. In exchange, he tells them a set of instructions in order to have his life spared. In the catacombs, there is an old man who has blocked his mind from the outside world. He mumbles some cryptic stuff and McGill is eager to unlock his mind, but they need something to remind him of who he was, of his past life. The man mentions the name Riddell, and when you go into her room, she is there. She explains that the old man was the last of the Acadia Dragoons, and that he had lost his mind in the torture chamber. When the crew express interest in the room, she says that they need the sword Einslanzer. Thankfully, the sword that Kid was so intent on taking from the storeroom is the Einlanzer. When you insert the sword into a groove on the floor, the torture chamber stops and the group find a ring from behind a loose brick. They talk to the old man in the catacombs and when the ring falls out of Kid's pocket, his mind somewhat returns. He mistakes Kid for Riddell and asks her if she has forgotten about the secret entrance to the frozen flame, seeing as Kid was shouting at him about it before. He says the third candlestick in the left in the ballroom activates the hidden path. The man returns to his state of mindlessness and the group leave. In the ballroom, the switch is activated and they descend in what seems like an elevator that is made up of the entire room. Walking down the corridor at the bottom, the group stumble into a devil's circle with some very specific instructions to escape it, similar to the nonsense that the griffin had told them. Once free, they reach the end of the corridor and find a mass ruin beneath the Viper Manor. Among the ruins of, apparently, the Kingdom of Zeal is the Frozen Flame, along with Lynx, who is waiting for them. This is where Surge learns that Kid was an orphan and that her caretaker, Luca, was murdered by Lynx. Before a young kid could seek out Lynx and exact revenge, McGill came into the picture and stopped and saved her before she made a fatal mistake. They fight Lynx for the frozen flame, resulting in McGill being pinned down by a powerful spell and Kid wounded by Lynx's attack. His plan is to acquire the Chrono Trigger from Kid, which was given to her by Luca before her passing. In order to bend space-time and allow the owner to reshape history, Surge is caught by Lynx and is slowly being choked to death, forcing Kid to hand over the Chrono Trigger. Although she seems obedient, Kid takes out the Chrono Trigger and breaks it, setting off a concentrated distortion where Surge sees many different parts of history play through, while Kid learns of her past, that she is an incarnation of Shala, the princess of the Kingdom of Zeal, who used her magic abilities to awaken Lavos. When Zeal fell, Shala was wrought with grief, so much so that the frozen flame in the Ocean Palace felt her strong emotions and changed her into a baby, sending her through time to when Luca found her and adopted her in the Chrono Trigger timeline. It is also hinted that McGill is actually Magus, her brother who sought out to find her at the end of Chrono Trigger. After the the distortion subsides, a large army from Pore infiltrate the manor, seeking the frozen flame. Lynx retreats and Surge, Kid, and McGill escape the manor. Once they are safe, Kid says that Luca's Chrono Trigger was lost. We couldn't even get our hands on the frozen flame. But it's okay. It's all okay because tonight, in my heart, a shiny new treasure was born. Surge, the single most valuable, unstealable treasure in the entire world. Knowing who I am, it's bigger than all of this. Bigger than Lynx, bigger than the Frozen Flame. And nothing can take that away. Not as long as I'm alive. Kid bids Surge farewell despite his pleas and disappears into the night with McGill.
Well, I hope you all like the sound of my voice because I'll be running the entire Chrono Cross plot segment of the video. There's a lot to cover, so let's get right into it. Our story follows Serge. He's a kid growing up in a small seaside village, and things seem pretty idyllic. He's tasked with picking up some dragon scales from enemies at a nearby beach, and it's here that the plot takes its first turn. After staring out at the sea for some time, Serge has this odd rush of images run through his head. A child playing, a panther, a tidal wave. As the water races ashore, a light surrounds him, protecting him from the wave, but he loses consciousness. After waking up on the beach, a passing stranger asks Serge if he's okay. Serge inquires about Lena, his childhood friend and he says she's back at the village. Back in the village of Arnie, Serge approaches Lena, but she has no idea who he is, and thus the crux of Chrono Cross's narrative is revealed. This is a parallel dimension story. Serge has somehow found himself in a world where he died of drowning as a young child. It seems preposterous, so for a while there is some confusion. Visiting his own grave, Serge meets Kid, um, who is Kid? Well, for now, who knows? She seems to have a connection to Serge and wants to help him figure out what's happened, while also getting the young lad to help her on her next mission to infiltrate Viper Manor. She's looking for an item known as the Frozen Flame. Does that sound familiar? Only if you've played Radical Dreamers. You hear word of a new advisor who has shown up on the scene and seems to have significant influence over Viper and the Acacia Dragoons, the Lord's highest ranking guardsmen. You gather some intel in Termina and head for Viper Manor. You can sneak into the manor in a number of ways, but regardless of how you choose to sneak in, the story will play out more or less the same. You skulk around the mansion, eventually meeting a character known as the Prophet, who fills you in on the alternate timeline situation you find yourself in. Eventually, you run into Lord Viper and his advisor, Lynx, the Demi-Human. You don't find the Frozen Flame here in Viper Manor, but Lynx offers us the next bit of plot to chew on. He hints strongly that Surge is a part of something bigger than he realizes. He calls Surge the Assassin of Time and the Chrono Trigger. What? After a hostage situation gone awry, Kid is struck with a poison dart and winds up infirmed in the fishing village of Guldove. The doctor, Matthew McConaughey, says the only cure is Hydra humor, something that doesn't even exist in this world anymore. It's here that we must figure out how to travel between the two worlds. The prophet hypothesized that it could be possible to jump between worlds, and Kid hands us an amulet. Hmm, amulet really came in handy in Chrono Trigger wonder if this will work the same. So Surge heads for Opasa Beach where we first woke up in another world. Sure enough, this is our link between worlds. Surge dives back into Homeworld, visits the Hydra Marshes, recovers some Hydra humor, and we return to Guldove in another world to have Matt McConaughey concoct a cure for Kid. With her out of the woods, it's time to get back to chasing down Lynx and the Frozen Flame. We learn that the route to Fort Dragonia goes through Mount Pyre, which is a raging active volcano. To cool off the hot, hot lava inside, we need to make contact with the Water Dragon. But to find them, we've got to make the switch over to Homeworld. On Water Dragon Isle in this timeline, the gnomes have invaded, displacing the fairies who had been calling the island home. The fairies insist that it was the humans who drove the gnomes to Water Dragon Isle.
After dispatching the gnomes and earning the ice breath from the water dragon, we get our first glimpse into Kid's backstory with an odd connection to both Chrono Trigger and to Lynx. Obligatory ghost ship. Back at Fort Dragonia, the plot gets turned on its head. Surge confronts Lynx, who spews some typical JRPG evil guy rhetoric. Do you know who you really are? If you deny me, you are denying your very existence. Which is all very cryptic at this point in the plot. But then, the frozen flame reacts. Surge gazes into it and sees Lynx's face in it. What does it mean? What's happened? Well, it seems as though we've got a body swap plot device to deal with. Surge and Lynx switch bodies. We know that something is up because Surge begins speaking dialogue we can read on screen. So they make it clear what has happened. Immediately after which, the party attacks Lynx. We see this encounter from his perspective, seeing as we are now in his body. It's a pretty rough spot to have hateful things spewed at you and people actively trying to end your life while you try to defend yourself. It's a pretty clever use of this plot device. Evil Surge wastes no time being evil, stabbing Kid, saying he's going to send her to Luca. He then claims to have the key to the gate of fate, and at this point it's not exactly clear what he means, because the dragon's tears shattered. We awake in a scene that looks like a painting, a distorted place between worlds. Eventually, making our way back into homeworld, leaving the dimensional rift behind. Now, brace yourself for a lot of racism against demi-humans, as Lynx gets nasty stares everywhere he goes. I guess the game is trying to paint humans as cruel, and it builds on the argument that humans are not in touch with nature, the planet, balance, etc. We all get to see Homeworld Termina, and it's come under the control of the poor army. Another Chrono Trigger shout-out. What could this mean for world building? Hmm. So this whole chapter of the plot is all about figuring out what Lynx, aka Evil Surge's, motivations are, and how to orchestrate a re-swapping of bodies. A key person we meet is Norris, a commander of the Black Wind unit of the Poor Army. Seems Lynx was busy in Homeworld too, as he approached Poor about the Frozen Flame. Much like in Another World, this leads us to Viper Manor, and like in Another World, General Viper and his men set off to find the Frozen Flame, this time to a place known as the Dead Sea. From here, we head to Marble and get some more information about the Dead Sea from Toma the Explorer, another nod to Chrono Trigger. After a couple of stops, including one to pick up the ancient sword Einlanzer, a shout out to Radical Dreamers, we are able to enter the Dead Sea, and the first scene we come across is a parted sea, frozen in time. It's pretty heavy-handed imagery, to be sure, evoking the biblical story of Moses parting the Red Sea. However, far from leading us to any kind of promised land, the parted Dead Sea only allows us to see up close the destruction of a civilization clearly from the future, as the architecture and technology on display are quite advanced. Here in the Dead Sea, we make our first connection to Lavos. We also seem to be following the child-sized ghosts of Chrono, Luca, and Marl around. When we eventually come to Nadia's Bell, our most concrete connection to Chrono Trigger yet. Here is where we get a healthy dose of exposition linking the two games. The world in this timeline has been destroyed, and the ghost children pin the blame on Surge. Then we meet Miguel, man with the most nondescript name, but with all of the info. Miguel gives us the lowdown, explaining that 14 years ago, he and Serge's father, Wazuki, washed up in the Dead Sea, before it was dead, seeking to cure Serge of some illness. However, 10 years ago, something happened that transformed this weird futuristic city into the Dead Sea. Time stopped. The Dead Sea becomes an eternal utopia, a place and time that belong to no one. Miguel lays out how alternate timelines are established, at least how this series deals with space-time mechanics. 
Each choice you make creates a new world and brings forth a new future. But in doing so, you eliminate another potential future from happening. Miguel thinks we might be strong enough to create a new future for humanity that would avoid the mistakes that lead to the destruction we see before us. It is only Surge who can take the frozen flame and change the future. So, we need to get into another world to reach the Sea of Eden, as we believe that unlike in Homeworld, the weird future city we saw in the Dead Sea might still be intact, hidden behind the clouds, and might serve as a key to resolving the timelines. But, when we return to another world, we find that Poor has taken over this world's termina as well, which means our heroes can't get a boat out of town to get to the Sea of Eden. We have to work with the remaining Acacia Dragoons, Karsh, Zoa, and Marcy, to save Lady Riddell, while also figuring out an escape plan. They tell us that they arrived at Fort Dragonia just after all that body swap nonsense went down, and found an item known as the Tear of Hate there. We all make haste for Hermit's hideaway, but are soon followed by Kid and Evil Surge. It seems as though Kid has been brainwashed and is doing Evil Surge's bidding. We make our first attempt at reaching the Sea of Eden, but are turned away at the front door. The pearly gates aren't open, having been sealed by the dragons. Interestingly, we've got the pearly gates here, and in Homeworld, the entrance to the Dead Sea is Death's Door. Pretty fitting. Well, time to talk to some dragons. The next chapter of the game involves collecting relics from the six dragons between home and another world. Thanks to some ancient dragon items we get from the shaman Stina in Guldov, we can make contact with the dragons that reside in El Nido. In Homeworld, water, earth, and green. And in another, fire, dark, and sky are the dragons. This is the fairly standard RPG trope of collect the legendary things to unlock the next thing, whether it's crystals, relics, or insert your item here. It doesn't really matter, but it involves a series of fights against tough bosses to prepare you for that final push. After taking care of the six dragons, you return to Stina in Homeworld, and she grants you the full dragon tier to unlock the path to the Sea of Eden. The way forward is through Fort Dragonia in Homeworld, and with the dragon tier in hand, the fort opens up for Surge. Evil Surge is waiting for us here, and he's not ready to return your body just yet. So after a fight, he pieces out. The way to the top has been made easier for us this time around, and we head straight to the top. Here, Surge, links must enter the main chamber alone. We get a brief history lesson on humans' relationship to Lavos, and then the main event begins. The dragon tear glows bright as Surge Lynx looks into it. After a cool cutscene with a creepy baby Surge, Surge is reborn as the dragon tear shatters into a million pieces. One shard that we retrieve becomes the Tear of Love, which if we combine with the Tear of Hate, may form the powerful Chrono Cross, whatever that is. In the Dead Sea Ruins, a distortion in space-time has opened up, and a voice determines that Surge is worthy of entering the Sea of Eden. After a hilarious disc change transition screen, we arrive in the Sea of Eden, where a triangular wall of water appears to be guarding something. So we must visit the three points of the triangle marked past, present, and future. Once tested by the guardian of the Sea of Eden, Vita Duo, the wall of water gives way to reveal the future ruins, the time fortress, Chronopolis. This is where the game gives up literally everything that was hinted at previously. So much exposition, it is just crazy. There is a lot of information to parse here in Chronopolis. We'll address a lot of it in the theme section of the video, but for now we'll just try and cover the basics. The place is overrun with robots who are fairly hostile, as well as apparitions of people who worked in Chronopolis. They talk about performing an experiment that will potentially give them the power to manipulate time, 
thus gaining control over history, which seems ominous. <laughs> okay, so basically, Chronopolis and its computer system, Fate, constructed El Nido and have run the lives of its citizens in a kind of surveillance state, always watching, making sure things stay orderly. Lots of talk about mind control and memory manipulation. Cloning and simulated personalities are discussed. These researchers talk about how death itself may not exist, if all of this artificial technology works the way it should. Now, everything is going great for fate, until 14 years ago when Surge came into contact with the flame. The reptites get a shout out, and it turns out, in an alternate timeline, they become the dominant species. But even in that timeline, the fall of Lavos brought about the Ice Age, which killed them off. Zeal is mentioned, but only as told through legends. We find out that thanks to Chrono and Pals, timelines exist where Lavos didn't emerge and destroy the planet. Chronopolis exists on one of those timelines, one with a future that doesn't end in ruin. Shout out to Luca and her time traveling theories. She did some work with the Time Egg and miniature black holes and is mad respected for it. And we hear about this place called the Time Research Lab, on which Chronopolis is based, which appeared out of nowhere in 2300 AD, headed by Belfazar. There's even a computer file that mentions radical dreamers. Uh, memories of time spent with Kid, a notebook full of memories, then a conversation. Are you ready, Kid? Stay on your toes. Seems to be an archive from a different time than our own, says one of your party members. So there's our explanation for where Radical Dreamer stands in and amongst all the timelines. We then head for the core of the facility, Project Kid, and the actual frozen flame itself. Lynx reveals himself to be the physical manifestation of the Fate computer system. This whole plot has been ongoing since the storm that blew Wazuki, Miguel, and Surge to Chronopolis. When the frozen flame sensed Surge's presence, it brought him in, healed him, and made him the arbiter of the Fate system. But when Surge was returned to Arnie, Fate could no longer work as effectively without the Arbiter close at hand. A circuit in the Fate computer malfunctioned, setting off a rebellion against the Fate system. The Ashtier circuit board was the cause. A voice welcomes Surge back and asks him to end the feud between Fate and the Dragons. Lynx orders Fate to kill Prometheus, to which it replies, affirmative. The battle against fate begins, and the most Mitsuda of joints starts playing. Kid, who has been here the whole time, awakens and wants the frozen flame. She reveals some more plot threads about a counter-time experiment and a time crash, and that Chronopolis got sent back in time, but also the Reptite's home, Anopolis got pulled in from another timeline. It's messy stuff that we'll unpack later. So the situation we're faced with is the natural world and the technological world are on a crash course for disaster conflict between the two seemingly inevitable. We have been somewhat misled by Harl to open up access to the Fate system and the Frozen Flame. By destroying Fate, we resurrected the Terra Tower, home of the dragons, and broke the seal keeping the dragons apart. United, the dragons and Harl, who we find out is some sort of seventh dragon, lie in wait in Terra Tower to exact their revenge on humanity. We get a final bit of backstory on Kid with a flashback to Luca's home engulfed in flames. This scene was teased earlier, but now we get the full cut. We rescue Kid Kid from the burning house. We see Lynx and Harl in the home, as this is where Lynx attempted to abduct Luca to force her to open the Prometheus circuit at Chronopolis. It's a dire scene for sure.
To end all this madness, we must go to Terra Tower. Inside, we learn that Terra Tower was in fact built by the Reptites, a symbol of revenge. The Reptites despise humans because humans came into contact with Lavos, causing them to evolve faster, making humans Lavos' offspring and extraneous to the planet. In Terra Tower, there is a space that doesn't exist, which looks a lot like the library from Viper Manor. The Prophet reveals himself to be Balthazar, and he explains the story of how the Kingdom of Zeal fell, and how he was flung into the future. His research would lead to Chronopolis and the Time Crash. He used the Epoch to travel through time. He tells us about Dinopolis, the dragons, and how fate sealed them and took up shop in the Sea of Eden. Balthazar gets to the truth that fate was the protector of humanity, and the dragons were in opposition to man. Balthazar explains what the Chrono Cross is to us. It's the melody and the harmony. It has the power to cross space and time and unify people's thoughts and feelings. It has the power to transfer memories. It has the power to combine the sounds of the world into one melody. We meet the Dragon God, oddly named the Time Devourer, and he gives us an allegory to chew on. Animals must kill and consume those that threaten their existence. So must one destroy another world in order to allow one's own to continue. Hmm. The Dragon God exists in a quasi-real form, in that the original was consumed by Lavos, but is able to skip through space and time and manifest itself at will. Balthazar shows up again and tells us that the Frozen Flame is a splinter from Lavos, Connecting with the frozen flame is connecting to Lavos, and as mediator between Lavos and the living world, there is a great responsibility and power at stake. We must return to where this all started, Opasa Beach, to weave together the rift in the space-time fabric. Balthazar gives us the time egg to travel beyond space-time. Just then, the Terra Tower falls to the sea, and then, like, kind of evolves into a final form. We then hit the beach and talk with the ghost children, who give us our final plot dump. Scala was sucked into a dimensional vortex along with the Madden Machine when Zeal fell. Scala and Lavos merged into the Devourer of Time, and before she was consumed by Lavos's evil, she heard Surge crying and set about to save the boy by creating the storm that would lead Wazuki and Miguel to Chronopolis. She then cloned herself and sent her copy to this timeline. This copy is Kid. Then we get the last big stinger, that Lynx is Wazuki. Corrupted by coming close to the frozen flame, Wazuki became unstable, and in that moment of weakness, fate seized him and turned him into a vessel to do its bidding. The final fight is one of the more interesting final boss fights out there as it relies on using the element system in a specific order to make use of the Chrono Cross. If you perform this correctly, you get the good ending, and the fight goes by in no time. The end text is made up of the finest 1990s JRPG philosophy money can buy. What is the meaning of our existence? Must we fight? Can't we all work together? Eventually coming to a semi-conclusion that every life form contributes to the creation of a new universe. The intricate balance of nature and beauty of life, though it may seem ephemeral, fragile, and dreamlike, it all plays a part. The two worlds will be unified once again and Surge will return to his life with no memories of what transpired. But 
he will get to live. Then we get some vague dialogue in Kid's voice, letting Serge know she'll find him again someday soon. The ending is quite open-ended as to what happens to our main characters, but there are strong theories that suggest Serge and Kid do find one another.